Good morning. My name is Mark Welsh. I'm the pastor here at Polk Street United Methodist Church. I'm so honored that you chose to worship with us. It's my prayer and all of our prayer that you would connect with God in a special way as together we worship the Lord in music, in word, and in deed. So I pray God's blessings on you this morning as together we lift up the name of our Lord. Good morning. Good to see everyone this morning. Did you come prepared today? Did you take any time this morning before you came to worship here in this building to prepare your heart and think about all the great things God's done in your life, namely giving his one and only son to be our savior? We have a lot to be thankful for, don't we? We have a lot to worship the Lord about today. So I hope as we enter into this service, your heart's ready and prepared to give God all the praise and the glory for what he's done for us. Our ushers are handing out registration pads, and I hope that everybody will fill those out today, and it'll help us keep accurate records in the church office. And while you're doing that, take a look at your bulletin inserts. We're going to kick off our Fall Wednesday activities this coming Wednesday. We're going to have a meal at 5 o'clock, chicken strips. And if you would like to participate in that meal, just call the church office, give them your name, and you're going to be there. And then afterwards, you're going to have children, youth, and adult activities. Pastor Mark's going to kick off a Bible study on Proverbs and prayer, and uh, you won't want to miss that. That'll be three weeks, and then the next three weeks, I'll be teaching a Bible study, and then the next three weeks, Margie will be teaching one. And you can sign up for those right out here in the narthex. Also look at other ways to connect with Christ. Have you said a good word about the Lord Jesus Christ to anyone this past week? Or have you invited someone to come and worship with you here at Polk Street United Methodist Church? This reminds us of the Lord's great commission in Matthew 28. Go make disciples of all nations. Let us pray. Lord, we're so thankful to be in your presence this morning and prayer for myself is that I'll lay my pride down and humble myself before you that you might fill me Lord and use me this coming week to share the good news of your love and grace help all of us Lord to be changed and transformed in your presence as we worship you today we pray this in Christ's name amen good morning Will you please stand and join me in the call to worship printed in your bulletin? Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you will renew the face of the earth. So if you'll remain standing and take a moment to greet those around you uh, and even Walk across the aisle if you need to.
everybody. How are y'all today? Good. You doing good? All right. Come on down. Yeah. Come on. How are you? Okay. So, all right. Got a quiz for you here. Do y'all know what this is? What is this? What's on here? Clay. Clay. Eh, wrong. Stone. Pottery. It's not clay. Not potting up. Nope. This is a beautiful cup. Yes, it is. Mm. Yeah. It's a beautiful cup. I'm telling you, it is. That's a cup. It's a beautiful cup, yes. Yeah, and I'll explain that here, okay? Well, my friend Cindy, she makes beautiful pottery. And how she works with clay um, kind of reminds us how Jesus works in our lives, okay? You're like, what? How does Jesus work in our lives with clay? Pot what does that even mean, right? <clears throat> well, you know, we kind of start out as this, as baby Christians here. We're kind of... That doesn't look very useful, does it? This block, blob here, doesn't look very useful right now. But we start out like that, okay? Then we get placed on the potter's wheel, okay? Plop, we're placed on the potter's wheel. Jesus starts working on our lives. And it takes some time, you know? You want to hold that for me, Ryan? Thank you. Um, you get plopped on the potter's wheel and things you start getting formed in there jesus starts working in our lives and you start to make something okay and then after that looky there now there's a cup and it's inside this thing it's called a kiln is what it's called and you want to know how hot it gets in there hot. very like super duper hot like hotter than our summer's hot 2200 degrees could you believe that it gets it sits in there at 2,200 degrees. So they sit in there for a long time, okay? They have to get heated up. And they make a beautiful piece of pottery. And sometimes, though, they crack in the kiln, kind of like this one. Do you see this? Can you see the cracks in there? Those cracks, they kind of remind me of, like, the mistakes that we make in our lives. And... Um, and so, like, say, this crack right here is a, oh, I looked on my friend's paper during school and I shouldn't have. I told a story to my friend and I shouldn't have done that. There's another crack. Or I took a toy to school one time and my parents told me not to and I did it anyway. Oh, there's another crack on there. Well, it's my friend Cindy. What she does after this is cracked, she pours a glaze over this, and it seals those cracks. And I got to think, that's kind of like how what Jesus does for us. We have sin in our lives, and we stop, and we are like, I'm sorry, Jesus, I did this. Please forgive me. And Jesus covers our sins and covers that up. And so just like how this cup is still useful and still beautiful, so are we. So even though we can mess up, we ask Jesus to forgive us, and we are still beautiful, and we are still useful. He can use us. And this is probably my favorite cup that she's made me, and you might say I have a little addiction to her cups because I have a few, but this is my favorite because it reminds me, whenever I look at it, it reminds me of how even though I may mess up in life, God has covered me and covered my sins and made it all okay. And I'm still useful. He can still use me even though I mess up sometimes. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and so this is probably my favorite one. She's like, Mary, whenever she made this, she said, Mary, I don't know if you want this. It has cracks in it. I was like, no, 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 no. That's perfect. That's perfect. What came to my mind immediately is how Jesus covers us, covers our sins and makes everything better. And I, I still drink out of this. It's a good cup. It still works. So, all right, let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much for covering our sins and making us so useful still. And help us to remember that you are shaping us and making us the best that we can be. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
this morning, I am honored to introduce to you Ken Pirtle. And if you notice this summer in the senior link, he is on the front cover. He has a wonderful article in here entitled, uh, Artist Within. So I would like for Ken to give us a snapshot of the artist within. Thanks, Mark. Um, when I was a kid, I didn't know where my talents lie. And I recall that in about the third grade, I drew a picture in my class and the teacher took it to the principal's office and I thought I had done something inappropriate. <laughs> but turned to find out, um, it was, she thought it was really good, and the principal hung it up in his office, Mr. Dobbs. Do you remember Mr. Dobbs, Lenita? So anyway, I began to realize that maybe I had some inner ability, and I was a visual person. I noticed beauty, I noticed sunsets, and I always had a passion to try to recreate it in some way. So when I went to college, um, my motivations were a little bit askew and I decided I wanted to pursue some uh, degree that paid a lot of money so the only thing that kind of fit the bill and fit my talents was maybe architecture but I quickly found out that while I made A's in my art classes I could not quite pass calculus and physics so but yet I know people who are really good at those things in fact my wife can pass calculus and hardly uh, put any effort into it with an A. But anyway, so God kind of gives us sense of these signals uh, to help us understand where our abilities are. And I did have a passion for art. I wanted to create things, but I didn't know what exactly. Um, in my college time, I had to take a photography class, and I really liked that. So that's when I sort of decided what I wanted to pursue. But all the while, um, as a junior, I recall um, I had to take a pottery class of ceramics. And at the time, I really didn't want to do that. We had just gotten married. And it was a 5 o'clock class in the afternoon. And I reluctantly went to take that class. And as it turned out, that was one of my favorite courses of all time, was making pottery on the potter's wheel. Um, but anyway, I finished the degree. Uh, came to Amarillo, taught photography at Amarillo College for 33 years, also served as the chairman for visual arts. But all the while, I remembered that when I was in my first year of college, there was a mosaic that was made on the side of a building at South Plains College. Uh, his name is Don Stroud, who did that. And I thought it was a wonderful piece of art. And I had it in the back of my head that I wanted to do that someday. So as I Fast forward 30 years, uh, as I approached retirement at Emerald College, I decided I wanted to pursue uh, building a mosaic in honor of Louise Daniel, who many of you in this congregation would remember. Um, so I took one of her photographs, I translated it on the computer into a mosaic, and I built that. That was my first one. Uh, since that time, I've done, fast forward uh, the last 10 years, I've done about 40. Uh, there's some in Houston at a movie theater, um, Lano Cemetery, two at the Botanical Gardens here in Amarillo. And um, I guess my favorite job, I did eight large mosaics on the east side of the football stadium at Texas Tech. So, and I'm, I went to Tech, so I'm kind of a, <laughs> a rabid raider and I'm proud of those. I should also mention that one of those mosaics honors uh, Wendy Nicholas, who was a longtime member at this church and a resident of Amarillo. He was a captain on the first football team at Texas Tech in 1925 when they were called the Matadors. So I had a passion inside me that God put there. Uh, I have lots of weaknesses. <laughs> I didn't pursue those. Uh, I can't fix my car. I can't do accounting. But I know people who have those skills. And we just have to remember that God gives us all certain distinct abilities. And as a community, we can get a lot of things done if we just take advantage of each other's skills and abilities. So in a nutshell, that's, uh, that's what I've done. So thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Ken. <laughs> thank you, sir. Philippians 4 tells us, do not be anxious about anything, 
but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. If you would take a look at your bulletin inserts to find a list of those we're praying for this week and add to the list of those in the hospital, Scott Smith, and also Reverend Margie McNear is not feeling well today and could not be with us and keep her in your prayers as well. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, you alone are God and you alone are perfect love. And as we worship you this morning, help us to see your glory and to experience your grace in a special way. Help us to look to you for every need in our lives and submit ourselves to your will and purpose. Give us the confidence to bring you all of our cares and concerns, our joys and our sorrows, knowing that you are willing and able to do immeasurably more than we can ever ask or imagine. We pray your presence and love to rest upon all those serving in the military and around the world and their family members and friends. We pray for those who have been hospitalized, that they may know your gentle, healing touch. Reveal yourself and your grace to each person in need as well as all those who care for them and are concerned. We pray for your comfort and peace to be made real in the family and friends of those who have died recently. We pray for those in our nation and around the world who are grieving the deaths of loved ones from the hands of godless acts of terror. We pray for your peace that passes all understanding for your abundant grace to carry them through the difficult days ahead. And Lord, we're very concerned about the fires in the Amazon, and we pray that you would open the floodgates of heaven and pour out rain to extinguish the flames. We thank you this morning for our partnership and ministry with San Jacinto Elementary School and our Child Development Center. We lift up the staff and parents and children asking your spirit to empower them to fulfill your purpose and will for their lives. Open our hearts and minds this morning by the power of your Holy Spirit that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed by Pastor Mark, that we may hear with incredible joy what you have to say to us today. We pray all this in Jesus' name, who taught us all to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite our ushers to make their way forward as they receive our tithes and offerings. And I was telling the early church that uh, a lot of y'all I know don't get to see the impact you're making through your giving to the ministries of Polk Street United Methodist Church. But I'm, I'm able to get out a lot and over at San Jacinto and different places and the ramp projects and all these different areas where you're touching lives and you're making an eternal difference for Jesus Christ and his kingdom. Thank you. Will you please join me in our operatory prayer printed in the bulletin? God of creation and architect of the universe, you knew where to place the stars and when to set the cosmos in motion. And still you know each and every one of us. Before we were born, even in our mother's womb, you knew us and had plans for us to be filled with your love and light and to bring that love and light to the world. Mighty and gentle God, may these gifts we dedicate this morning be used to bring light and hope to sisters and brothers we haven't met yet. May our arms and legs be used to take that hope out into the world this day. And may our words and our prayers convey that love to those we need. In the name of Christ, our Redeemer, we pray. Amen.
with singing, come before his presence with singing. hymn is Spirit of the Living God. You can find that in the hymnal as hymn number 393, or the words are printed in your bulletin. If you'd rather do that, we'll sing it twice. Please turn your bulletins 
To read the scripture this morning comes from Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 6. Let's read the word of our Lord together. He said, Can I not do with you, Israel, as this potter does, declares the Lord. Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, Israel. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. This last Wednesday was such a joy to be with you as we celebrated Polk Street. So we talked a little bit about where we've been, where we are now, and we're go- where we are going this year with our Vision 2020. We have a great staff. We have so many volunteers, so many small groups that make Polk Street what it is. And so I hope that you'll be involved. You'll check out a Sunday school class. You'll come to a Wednesday night Bible study. That this year, some way, somehow, you'll get a little bit more involved. I promise you won't regret it. And you'll be blessed in the process. Not only did we hear about the vision. Not only did we hear from our staff how to get involved. We had a 30-foot banana split Sunday. And that was the coolest thing for our people. At the end of the night, there was no ice cream left at all. But Polk Street sure is fun. Thank you for making this a fun place to be, a fun place to serve, and a blessing to be a part of. So let's pray. Lord, we pray now that as we dive into your scripture, Lord, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our God, our rock, and our redeemer, and all of God's people said, Amen. Confirmation class had just started. The kids were excited about learning all the different facets of the faith, learning from the different ministers and taking a tour of the church. They loved it when the organist pounded on the organ and made it really loud. They loved traveling to different churches and seeing what the different perspectives were, seeing what the different personalities of each denomination were. They loved hearing about Wesley's quadrilateral. And coming up with some of their own theological assumptions. It was interesting to see little sixth graders banter back and forth theologically. But still love each other deeply. They grew in their faith. They enjoyed getting to know each other. And even seeing where each other came from. But it came to a surprise to everyone. When one of the sixth graders, one of these young ladies, developed pneumonia. And she went to the hospital. She had to go into a coma to try to deal with pneumonia. And it was a huge shock to the whole community when she passed. This confirmation class was broken. Not only them, but all the sixth graders in the whole school. In fact, the whole church loved this little girl. Saw her grow up. And for her to be taken so quickly was heartbreaking. Well, the next week, after the funeral, the confirmation class went on their retreat. The children's minister just didn't know what to do. Their hearts were broken. It was hard to captivate their minds and their hearts again because they were so broken. But as they arrived on the retreat, she challenged them to find a plate. And she had placed a whole bunch of different plates out on the table. Each one would go and pick up one and they were all colorful and different and unique and beautiful and she gave them a hammer and she said I know that you feel broken and that you're mad and that you're hurt God can handle that and she encouraged them in their own time in their own prayer in their own way to take their beautiful plate with a hammer and smash it And break it. And claim that brokenness. And then grab a piece of that plate. And take it to a cross that is made out of clay. And to put that piece of pottery, that plate piece, in the cross. 
you could have heard a pin drop besides all the smashing. The, the, the weeping of the kids pounding the plate, taking the, the pottery and making this pretty bland piece of clay into a beautiful mosaic cross. At the end, when the cross was full of all these little pieces of pottery, they all gathered around in tears, held hands, thanked God for their friend, but also surrendered their brokenness yet once again. This morning in, in the scripture, Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. He was very gloomy often. In fact, he cried because it seemed like sometimes he was the only one that was calling people back to God. He did this for 40 years. That's a long time to be in ministry. For 40 years, he, he was broken because of his suffering, because of his brokenness before God, but also because of his, his faithfulness to God and God's faithfulness to him. Because of that, he's like the probably identified as one of the most Christ-like figures in the Old Testament. So Jeremiah was like the ultimate children's minister. He loved using objects to relate our relationship with God. He continually called Israel back to God by using these objects. He used nine different objects. A branch of an olive tree, uh, of an almond tree, a boiling pot, a ruined linen belt, broken jars, two baskets of figs, a yoke, large stones, a scroll sunk in the river, and he used pottery. As he talks about this potter's clay, please join me in your bulletin. There's a little outline for you as we look at Jeremiah chapter 18. So verse 1 says, This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. God was at work in Jeremiah's life. Even though he was sad, even though he was struggling, even though he was broken because Israel was broken. Israel was not following God. Israel was not fulfilling the destiny that God had for them. It wasn't living for God's purpose. And this hurt him. This broke him. And he weeped and cried out to the Lord and said, God, help me help my people. And so God was at work. God called him. No matter how far Israel went, God was still at work. Isn't that interesting? Sometimes when struggles come, that's when sometimes we need to be more alert. Even when we're broken, God's still at work. God's always at work. God's always ready and willing to redeem us to bring us back to him, to call us into that yearning. You can't outrun God. Even if you take a thousand steps from God, all it takes is one step back. That's the good news of the gospel, that all of us at all times are called, are welcomed back into the fold. And so God called Jeremiah. He didn't ask Jeremiah to give what he didn't have. He filled in that grace and that love and that hope into Jeremiah first. So then what happened? Verse 3, it says, So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. Jeremiah listened and then did what he heard. Oftentimes we're so busy that we don't really listen to what's going on. We don't really listen to what is really being said. Parker Palmer writes in his book, Let Your Life Speak, that there is a sacred center in everyone, and that sacred center is everyone's true self. And that true self has all the potential, but also all the proclivities. As we journey into who we really are, we discover that light, but we also discover and realize our darkness. For if we're to be faithful to our true selves, we need to listen to who we are, to listen to our identity. Who are we? 
not who we ought to be, not who the church tells me who I ought to be, or my family of origin, or society, or even my ego, or my pride, but to really listen, what am I passionate about? Who I am? Who am I? What has God created for me? Not only our identity beyond the service, but our limits. We all have a limited amount of time. We all have a limited amount of resources and influence. We all have ceilings. And that's just part of being human, part of our life. And so when we really listen to ourselves, we discover our gifts. What are we passionate about? What are we good at? What do we enjoy? What do we get up and want to come to church for, want to go to work for, or want to thrive in? Because we'll do what we want to do eventually. But second of all, not only understanding our gifts more fully and being able to utilize them, but to understand our shadows as well. Those struggles, those areas that we fall short in, those proclivities that we tend to come back around again, again and again and again, those distractions, those things that keep us from being that all we can be. But if we're going to listen to our true selves, we need that courage to be able to shadow box. Not just put those shadows under the rug, not just ignore them, but to fully engage them, to really deal with the darkness that we have and with our limitations to listen, to realize that if we're going to be spiritual, we need to address them And we need to be willing to change. You see, when the potter is making the pottery, the potter's not sitting there telling the the clay what to do. The clay's working with it. And the clay has certain ingredients, different levels. But the clay also presses back on the potter's hand. And they work together. But it's the clay that adjusts to the potter. The scripture in verse 4 says, But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as it seemed best to him. Shaping him into this new life, changing him, working through that marred area. When we adjust, we're willing to engage our shadows and deal with those dark areas in our lives. And when we look at them and claim them and try to understand them, but our very understanding of who we are by listening and then able to adjust, we're ready to battle those shadows and live in the light. Many of those shadows come to us in many different realms. Perhaps a fear of insecurity, not really sure about our identity or our worth. Looking at our worth through the world, through other people, our identity from things that we should ought to be rather than what really are. Fear of losing a fight. Fear of not being successful. I believe that, that the ultimate responsibility for everything rests on us. Fear of losing control. Or maybe a fear of chaos. Parker Palmer suggests that the ultimate fear and also the ultimate denial is the fear of failure in death. That all of us have a limited amount of time. All of us will eventually die. And overcoming that fear and understanding that we have limits and that one day we will be gone and that we will get older and become weaker and more frail. And understanding that about ourselves, being self-aware, not doesn't deplete us, but gives us vision and gives us purpose and gives us meaning and gives us overcoming as we adjust to those things in life. So, for instance, 
Instead of looking at older age as getting weaker and not as influential, actually, as we get older, you become more free because you realize more of who you are, more understanding of the world, but also what God called you to be and to do. You see more and you understand more. For death, the ultimate failure, sometimes by the world's standards, comes to everyone But failure and death does not have the final word. It is not a failure. It's a promotion to the next world, to the heavenly realm, to those God has made a home for through Christ. And so death doesn't have a final word. It's not the ultimate failure. And when we release that fear and listen to ourselves and adjust to that fear and understand that God has a bigger plan, than our little fears, then we can adjust and understand who we are within the bigger realm and not be afraid of failure or not be afraid of those fears, but live into the glorious light because we've boxed those shadows. We understand our gifts and our graces. My grandfather was 90 years old. My parents went to him and said, It's about time for you to move into a retirement home. He was not happy about that. He said, I don't like anyone telling me what I need to do. He lived in his house for over 50 years. He built his house. It was uh, made out of brick, and it was an adobe house, very unique. He loved his house and everything in it. Every room was filled with all kinds of stuff from around the world. He didn't want to live into a retirement home where he'd have two bedrooms, where he'd have to see other people that he didn't want to see. And he, he just wanted to stay at home. He'd been at home his whole life. This is his house. But he had to realize he was getting older, and now was the time. It took him a couple of years. But as he adjusted and listened to his, his own body, listened to his family, listen to his limits, his struggles, some of the reasons why he wouldn't want to go. Finally, he did. And as he went, something happened in his life. Gone were the chips on his shoulder of fear and madness. In fact, as a 91-year-old at the retirement home, he was one of the young, cool guys. In fact, he loved playing bingo. He often went 10 cents a card. He won 60 cents one time. So proud. He'd get together at 4 o'clock for happy hour with all the World War II vets. And they'd tell the same stories over and over and over. I went a couple times and I loved hearing those stories. Great, strong, mighty, courageous young men now in the retirement home. But living together with hope. He had three full meals. He had a community. So he adjusted. And he changed. He realized who he was. And he went with it. But it wasn't easy. Sometimes it, it takes courage to yield, to adjust. So the scripture says... In verse 5, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, said, Can I not do with you, Israel, as the potter does, declares the Lord? Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand. You see, when we shadow box those fears, when we name them and claim who we are inside, know that we're marred, and yet God is working in our lives even in our darkness and our pain, that God can redeem those and use us as we overcome them. And that power of God that's beyond ourself becomes a treasure. And we can live as, as clay treasures. For it takes a collaboration for God revealing himself to us as God moves and lives and is in our lives 
and we yield to God and say, God, help me with this. That was the whole reason of Jeremiah's message is to call Israel back to God, not depend on themselves, but say, God, I need you. And be able to adjust, and be able to change where God leads. Charles Darwin says it's not the strongest or the most intelligent that wins the fight, but it's the one that is most adaptable to change. To be able to yield to understand that our life is such a bigger picture of God's grace and it's God's power in us so that when we do realize those struggles, those shadows, those dark moments of the soul, God's power can sustain us because we know whose we are and who we are. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 and 9 says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay, to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. You see, we're all on the potter's wheel. We are all a work in progress. We're all there, but not yet. The number one thing is to not give up, to continually listen, adapt, and yield to that call from God, to decipher through some of the aughts of our society, those aughts of things that might not be of God, and understand who we are in the sight of God. It takes a collaboration, that God wants to work within our brokenness to help us be all that we can be, to not hide from it, to not run from it, to understand that brokenness and give it to him at the cross to make a beautiful mosaic of why he came in the first place, that he might absorb all of our brokenness, our sin, our pain, and make it a beautiful picture of God's grace and God's love. Well, that Sunday of confirmation, About a month after that retreat, it was a sacred time. The confirmation class dedicated a big old cross, a beautifully colored cross with all the different pieces of pottery to the church. And when they got up and they accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, they meant it. Because they wanted to go to heaven when they died. And it wasn't just something that was going to be 70 years from now. They knew it could happen any time. But not only that, they knew that the product is heaven, but it's also a process where we are continually molded by God. And that foundation of that grace of Christ helps us build and mold and grow and be molded by that potter who loves us tenderly and caresses us into who God's created us to be. So today... I'm not sure what part of our lives we're feeling pain, brokenness, struggle. Those areas in our life that are darker than they should be. I want to encourage us to have the courage to shadow box, to deal with some of that brokenness by simply surrendering it to God. Give it to God and say, God, work with me. Help me be all that I can be in you. May I find freedom in identifying those fears and surrendering them to you to be the beautiful person that you've made me to be hidden in the cross. And that's the good news of the gospel, that God has a plan for us and God wants to form us into beautiful clay treasures. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you came to conquer death and sin, that you shadow boxed the darkness and your light overcame it. Lord, thank you that you are working with us. Thank you that you are molding us into beautiful creations that we are 
And yet, we're not there yet. May we never, ever give up. Lord, may we yield and adjust to some areas where we choose and some that are chosen for us. But whatever may come, may we know that we are in your hands, that you are molding us and forming us. And Lord, may we give you all the honor, the glory, and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning, as we close in a word of prayer, and as we close in our song, I'm going to ask you to stand and sing to the Lord. As we lift up our hearts, I pray that as we sing, we'll go our brokenness to God yet once again. As we close this morning, would you please grab hands with the person next to you? Okay, I want you to look to the person to your right and say, you're not finished yet. (laughs) And look to your left and say, God is molding you. May we all remember that we're a work in progress, that we, even though we're not perfect, we're in Christ, and that we, my friends, are clay treasures. Every single one of us are treasured in God's eyes. May we never forget that. And now may we go forth knowing how treasured we are in Christ. May God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit Be with us all now and forevermore. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.